morning, everyone. Uh, I'm, this, my name is Pei Pei Zhou. I'm a PhD student from Professor Jason Kong's lab. Today, I'm uh, here to give my final defense talk. My dissertation topic is modeling and optimization for customized computing, performance, energy, and cost perspective. Uh, thanks all my committees for coming here today. And, uh, so I have been here for seven years since 2012. And uh, here's a published ca uh, publication list that I have uh, during this uh, seven years journey. And uh, my uh, lead author paper are highlighted in bold. And also uh, this year we have won this uh, best paper award for TCAT. So first let me briefly uh, motivate my work in customized computing modeling. First is that uh, accelerators um, has been widely used these days, and uh, as Moore's law advances, the CPU core scaling coming to an end, and uh, uh, the uh, power CPUs are now more and more power hungry, and the powerism helps to relieve that, and then the customization, including all those accelerators, help this further. So FPGA serves as a great because it provides both uh, flexibility and also uh, efficiency. It has uh, mo um, it can achieve 10 to 100x energy efficiency than general purpose CPUs. And the accelerators are now deployed in multiple levels, from the single chip level to the node level and all the way up to the cluster level. Let me explain them one by one. So in the single chip level, let's uh, talk about this system on chip FPGAs. These can be seen in many different places. For example, IoT devices, where these uh, devices are tiny and are power hungry, or in this uh, self-driving car scenarios, where we can only afford less than 100 watts budget for the power. So in this uh, single chip uh, level, this, the performance and the battery life uh, matter. So this graph actually shows uh, one of my work in uh, FPJ chip level optimization. So we have designed a micro architecture that helps to improve the frequency of the FPJ chip when we scale up this design. So that's uh, um, compared to the baseline high level census FPJ design, our, uh, our micro architecture, uh, I give a name Latte, can actually uh, improve 1.5x so performance improvement, which translates to 1.5x performance improvement. And the accelerator in the low level, we are talking about a, a system which is a CPU and an FPJ uh, uh, system, where this uh, CPU and FPJ talks to each other through this PCIe interface. So here was a, um, actually a server, actual server for the Amazon AWS F1 instance, where this FPJ cards are inserted into the server through the PCIe interface. And uh, for this CPU and FPJ systems, FPJ kernels takes these computation intensive and deeply pipelined half, uh, portion of the program, while the CPU handles the rest of the part, and the data is transferred through this uh, PCIe. So this is a computation model for CPU and FPJ uh, systems. And uh, in this system, uh, we can think uh, we can see that the performance. And uh, if talking about public cloud deployment of this system, dollars or out of pocket money uh, matters, matters a lot. And also this accelerators now are deployed in many, many different cloud services. So since 2000, actually 2010, the Microsoft has been uh, using this FPG in their data centers. And uh, since then, Amazon, Baidu, Huawei, and Alibaba, they are deploying their FPG instances and also the uh, latest is that uh, Tencent and also Index are also using FPJ uh, in their cluster and provided to the uh, customers. So in this cluster level deployment, performance and cost uh, matter a lot. So we can take a kind of like a quick look at this uh, prices in AWS. So these are some of the most expensive instances in AWS, F1, uh, in AWS EC2 machines. So what I highlighted here is the F1 16x. This is the FPG instances, which means has a great 
uh, computation power, and also it is really expensive. It's like thirteen dollars an hour just for this one instances. We know that some of the instances are quite cheap. It's as cheap as like twenty cents uh, an hour, but this one is really expensive. So today in my uh, uh, dissertation presentation, I'm going to cover the uh, five later chapters of my dissertation. So for the single chip level, I already covered the energy efficiency of full pipelining in my oral exam, and uh, the K, which I briefly introduced in this introduction slides. And uh, starting from now, I'm going to explain this node level performance cost modeling, which also considers both the computation and also the storage, and how we can apply what we have for the node level optimization into cost level, considering two different scenarios, which is uh, which, which are public cloud and also the private cloud. So for public cloud, I'm going to um, explain <coughs> specifically for this uh, composable compute instances, which are enabled by MoCA framework. And also we will show the co-optimization of both storage and the computation in public cloud. Lastly, I will cover how we do this optimization in the private cloud, for example, our uh, local CDSC cluster. Before I um, dive into the details of this uh, modeling, I want to first give some backgrounds of the application we have uh, been studied for many years. So the application is uh, GTK, uh, Genome Pipeline Applications. GTK stands for Genome Analysis Toolkit, which is developed by Bob Institute. And this is a best practice that they provided in 2018 of this uh, genome pipeline stages for whole genome sequences processing and also whole exome processing. So I summarized the three main stages here from this uh, fast queue, which is a raw sequence data to this uh, analysis ready data in VCF file. So the first one is the alignment stage, uh, BWAM, which is called, uh, which is short for Bureau Willy Aligner. So this one is, uh, uh, it takes the raw sequence fast queue file as input and also takes the reference data and then maps all those raw sequence to this uh, uh, reads comparing to the reference data. So this one gives the BAM file. And then these BAM files actually, uh, each for each read basis, they have uh, reported the quality score. So quality score is the score that this, this uh, G, uh, ATCG is accurate, the confidence of whether this ATCG is confidence or not. So this quality score is very important for the downstream analysis. So based quality score calibration basically takes statistic scan, or take a scan of all those sequences quality and then build a statistic model and then based on this model to apply back the recalibrated score. So this is a quite important step, but it's less time consuming than this uh, previous stage alignment. The third one is a uh, calling variance. So in GTK for this, uh, uh, we, we call it the hypertype caller. So this one, it will um, find all those uh, variants that cause the either diseases or some kind of uh, syndromes, and uh, these things uh, compelling to the reference genome. Or Mutech 2 is another application, but, but basically do the same, uh, does the same thing, but for tumor sequences. So it compels a tumor sequence and also a normal sequence. So these are the applications we have uh, uh, focused on. Because we are con considering this uh, CQ and FPG uh, co-optimization, we actually have designed these accelerators for some of the most uh, computation intensive kernels in these uh, pipelines. So the first one is the smith waterman algorithm in BWA aligner. And the second one is hypertype caller, which is in GTK, uh, sorry, PEL-HM kernel, which is for hypertype caller in GTK. So these two algorithms, uh, first one, this uh, smith waterman takes around like 40% of the total computation time of aligner. And PowerGM takes around like 30 to 40 percent for hypertech color, and for mutech it takes around like 80 to 90 percent of the whole pi uh, whole mutech program. So these are really computation intensive kernels, and they are really good for uh, for FPG accelerator because it exposes many powers uh, in the algorithm. Uh, we first uh, explain uh, the, what we have observed from straightforward CPU to FPG integration and then uh, motivates our work for further optimization. So the first one is that uh, when we actually first uh, deploy this 
IPG uh, acceleration solutions in AWS cloud. So this one we are considering the AWS F1 instances, which has one FPG card, really uh, good. That is a VU90 chip, very uh, large chip. And but that instance only have uh, only has uh, eight CPU cores. So when comparing to this the baseline CPU solution, uh, we have observed 1.6x latency improvement. So from uh, this uh, comparing to this uh, pure CPU solution we have uh, shrink the runtime by 1.6x. However, when we calculate the real cost or out-of-pocket money we have, it actually improves uh, or cost more, um, like 2.58x. So we pay 2.58x more than the CPU solutions. This is for this uh, hypertype holder stage on AWS. And this actually happened for another application and also on other ser uh, cloud services as well. For example, for Butac 2, we observe the similar uh, similar things. Where well, this uh, Butac 2 latency improves by 1.49x, but cost like 1.16x more. So it costs slightly more than the original CPU solution. Why does this happen? So the first reason is that uh, a very intuitive reason is that FPG is not cheap in public cloud. For example, on AWS F1 instances, one FPG chip comparing to single CPU is like 25 CPU core. And uh, on Huawei cloud, this is similar, it's like 23 CPU core. And uh, for different cloud services, they actually provide different instances which has different CPU to FPG ratio. When I mean CPU to FPG ratio, this is one to eight on AWS and one to 32 on Huawei. So they have uh, provided different CPU to FPG, uh, CPU core to FPG ratio. But all those acceleration solutions is limited by Amdahl floor. So Amdahl floor gives a theoretical speed up, which is limited by the part of this task that can benefit from this acceleration. For example, for hypertype caller, you can uh, you can accelerate for whatever number you have, amazing number you have. But at most, uh, you can eliminate this part, but only achieves 1.6x speed up but you pay 4.1x more just to use this, launch this instance. So that explains the more or the extra dollars you paid for this uh, uh, CPU FPG solutions. And uh, this is uh, intuitive to think of, but when we need an uh, analytical model to describe the trade-off between these CPU FPG solutions comparing to CPU. So that's why we, um, uh, we need this modeling because uh, applications are different. For example, we, I list uh, three different types of uh, genome applications here. They have different kernel ratios. They also have different uh, FPJ speed up comparing to single core CPU. And also, uh, so that's why we need to uh, have analytical modeling to explain or to uh, further guide our optimizations. When, uh, when, when we do the straightforward CPU to FPG integrations, I have uh, concluded three different uh, situations where computation, of speed, uh, computation speed of CPU and FPG are either matched or CPU is faster than FPG or slower than FPG. For example, in this cases where we have a kernel which takes around like 50% of the total runtime of this program, and the FPG can give 8x speed up, and your CPU can have eight cores so this is I call the well-matched situation because whenever your CPU produces new data, then the FPG can take that data and then do the downstream analysis or do the upstream analysis. So this is uh, I call the well-matched uh, CPU FPG situation. However, there can be also cases where this FPG is fast. For example, in hypertype uh, hyper color, this uh, FPG only takes around like 40, 39% uh, of the total runtime but you get really good speed up, like 40x. So this is a CPU, um, so we have a CPU uh, only has eight cores, which means that if you want to, um, if you want to fully utilize all those 40x speed up for this FPG kernel, you need at least the 64 CPU cores to sustain the throughput. However, you only have eight CPU cores, which translates to another word is that your FPG is idling for the most of the time. So all those chip areas, all those uh, 
ESPs, so you are not using them at all. So in this case, 87% uh, of the FPG resource uh, wasted. So in other cases where this uh, FPG can also be slow, well, this is another extreme case, uh, MUTEC2, which takes 89% uh, of the total uh, uh, runtime. And uh, so in this case, this, uh, to sustain the throughput of a 40x speed up of this FPG, this you only need you only need eight cores CPU, but Huawei provi provides 32 CPU cores, and that translates to another 40, uh, 24 CPU cores basically idling there, waiting for uh, these the new data from this FPG, either in downstream or upstream analysis. So in both cases, we have observed uh, these uh, CPU or FPG resource idling or wasted. And uh, we want to propose an uh, optimization framework so that we can uh, better utilize the FPG when uh, CPU is slow and uh, better utilize the uh, CPU when FPG is slow. So which scenario is more likely? Sorry? Is it usually slow FPG or slow CPU? Uh, it happens. It yeah. both happens. Okay. Yeah. So for example, for this uh, genome, uh, applications, I see Centaurs and uh, GTK uh, hexatype color is uh, fast FPG, mm -hmm. but for this uh, PWA MAM and this uh, and uh, this uh, MUTEC two is slow FPG. Yeah. Depends on which phase of the computation. Hmm. So for the fast FPG, the proposed optimization is that we share this FPG among multiple CPU instances. So in this case, for example, we have uh, one FPGA chip here, and it can not only sustain the local CPU, and also it can sustain the throughput of the removed CPUs. Here I plot like two different type of uh, CPU instances, M2 4X and then F1 2X. And uh, they communicate to each other through this network. And also we can, uh, for slow FPGA cases, where well, FPGA is bottleneck. I want to first uh, give some explanation and on the uh, bottleneck cases and then explain how we optimize that. So for example, in this case, we have this uh, um, yellow part and also the blue part. So a yellow part, I mark it as the FPG offload re region and the blue one is the CPU operations. So there, when we increase this uh, number of CPU cores gradually, it will finally reach to a point where this FPG kernels becomes you know, basically bottleneck. And uh, no matter how many CPU cores you further increases, this uh, throughput is not further improved because it's constrained by this FPG throughput. So in this case, if, if we launch 10 CPU cores, the equivalent CPU cores that are running are only eight. So the lef left two core CPU cores are idling. So how we can fully utilize these two CPU cores? That's easy. That's just to do the co-scheduling of this FPGA plus CPU for this accelerated parts. When I mean co-scheduling, that is for the parts that can match the FPG resources, for this um, CPU cores, we launch this accelerated parts and offload the da uh, data to FPGA. But for the rest of the CPU cores, we can just instead of offloading, we schedule back or just don't send data and then do it by CPU cores themselves even though they are slower, but they are doing actually work, really work. So that's how we can improve the CPU utilization to co-scheduling. And by taking these two methods together, we can actually optimize this uh, cost in this public cloud. And I will show you how we have this, uh, how this composable compute instance, when I mean composable is that one custom uh, CPU instance with one FPG CPU instances together, that's composable instances. So can I ask a question? So you mentioned for the, one of the cases you end up sharing the FPGA across the CPUs and they communicate over the network. So what's the, I mean, what's the overhead of doing that and what situations can you do that and, and, and when would it make sense? Yeah, so, uh, so there are some overhead actually. I have uh, show some data later is that uh, in the network, we have some latency, and uh, as but latency is not that critical. The throughput is critical, so as long as the throughput is good enough, is large enough for this computation data throughput, 
then it's okay and it has a minor effect as, as small as 5% uh, degradation to this performance. So and the network then never becomes an oh, issue? No, okay. not an issue. Because we can think in this way, like FPGA, its bandwidth is like, PCIe bandwidth is 8 gigabit per second. And this network on AWS is like at least 6.5 gigabit. So they are comparable to each other. So let me first introduce this uh, Mocha framework, which exposes, uh, exposes these two optimization opportunities in the cloud. So Mocha stands for multi-node optimization across the heterogeneous cloud with accelerators. You might notice I have many cafe-related paper now, Latte, Mocha, Docu, also uh, caffeine, yeah. Uh, so that's a way to stimulate me to finish the paper. Uh, so Mocha um, has three main parts. So the first time, uh, first is that we need to do the profiling, static profiling, to understand this application. That is the kernel ratio R and also the speed up of this accelerator. With these two numbers together, we can get a matching core number. That is the equivalent CPU cores to match the throughput of the FPG. With this number and together with the platform information, for example, how many CPU cores you have for each instances, we can set up the cluster accordingly. For example, for HTC, heptatype color application on AWS, this matching core number is 64. So in order to get 64 CPU cores together, we can first launch F1 2X with eight CPU core, another F4 10X with 40 CPU core, and another M4 4X, which has a 16 core. Together we have 64 cores. And we also need to launch this Mocha runtime, which handles this communication between this NAM, NAM is Node Accelerator Manager, which is uh, in the upper part. So this NAM then uh, is the is the is the intermediate um, uh, intermediate uh, part that talks to FPG and also talks to other CPU clients. So this Node Accelerator Manager will first get the data from all those CPU clients and then offloads to this local FPG and get back the data and also transfer back to all those corresponding CPU clients. That's how this Mocha runtime handles uh, the uh, computation. So with this, uh, uh, with this optimization, Mocha application optimization, we now have we now can report the runtime, new runtime, and also the new cost. So the third bar, the yellow bar, is our Mocha framework. So it achieves the least runtime or comparable to the least runtime and also achieves the least cost comparing to the CPU, both CPU solution and also the CPU FPG solutions. So this is quite, uh, 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 this is uh, quite matches with our actually modeling result. Uh, less than like, less than uh, 4.5 uh, percentage error. So the cost reduction comparing to the CPU and FPG solutions actually comes from we have a better utilization of this FPG instances. So instead of launch a 64 core with eight FPG instances, which is uh, like $13 per hour instances, we can just now launch one FPG instance, F12X with eight cores and another 64 CPU to match this computation throughput while paying much less than this uh, original solution. And in Huawei, we also observe similar thing. And so, because now we have exposed, uh, we can now make full utilize, uh, make full utilization of the CPU cores. The runtime first uh, shrinks by one point, uh, sub, uh, sorry, uh, one point five x. So uh, previously it uh, improves the one point five x. Now it improves like two point two seven x, and uh, that translates to one point five x cost uh, efficiency improvement. So we achieve both the least runtime and also both uh, the least cost, uh, which is uh, um, matches with our modern result as well. And uh, the underlying reason that the effective CPU cores previously is only eight, but now it's uh, 32. So we make more use of the CPUs. So with this uh, computation uh, instances, with this composable computation instances in hand, now we can do this uh, optimization together with the storage to achieve this uh, public cloud cost optimization, this full storage. 
Okay, can I ask you one question? Was there any anything interesting inside? I know you didn't really talk about the modeling very much, but was there anything interesting that you found of, or any sort of interesting techniques that you needed to use to model this situation? Or uh, for node level situation, it's uh, the modeling is kind of straightforward, or we call it just uh, divide and multiply. But uh, then for the cluster uh, level organization, oh. it's more interesting because we have introduced the integer linear programming to describe this oh, problem. Okay. Yeah. So that's where we start. Uh, that's where we can think in this problem. So I first uh, put this uh, graph to show the problems that we were trying to solve. So in public cloud, um, for example, you are given uh, data, genome data, and uh, you want to do uh, cost optimization because you are actually paying as you go, right? And uh, depends on either it's one genome sequence or batches of sequence. And depends on for on deadlines, if you want to finish in six hours or 12 hours, or you don't need to consider this deadline at all. And uh, we want to minimize the cost. So this savings can be really promising because for example, in Bob Institute, they reported they generate terabytes of data per, per day and also like tons of terabytes of this data uh, a year. So that actually translates to millions of dollars if you save 5% uh, or 10% for each genome you have. And uh, actually this problem is not new. Uh, many prior work has studied this and uh, they use IOP formulations um, to, uh, to get the optimal solution. So here I, um, I have a very uh, detailed uh, prior uh, work <coughs> survey in this dissertation, but now uh, for here I list uh, two of them, which is uh, most cited, well cited, and uh, one of them is uh, cost uh, of running uh, scientific work workloads. They are studying the astronomy applications, but they fail to discuss the storage, so they only consider the different number of uh, scheduled processors. The second one, they consider the storage and they consider memory, CPU, all those things. That's good. But they didn't consider what we have, I call this composable instances. Because what they studied or what they have in hand, instances are given. But what we have um, by MOCA is that we can compose the right number of CPUs together with the CP FPG instances to get the new instances we have for the, for the optimization. So that's where we have, uh, that's something, that's the, that's the new part. And the public cloud, we need to consider both the storage and the compute uh, uh, cost. So here are some of the listed, um, some of the listed prices and the instance type for CPU and also storage. And uh, different instances have different CPU types. Uh, I listed here as uh, M4, M5, C5, M4. So they stand for general purpose uh, computation, uh, throughput optimized uh, or computation optimized or memory optimized instances. And they have different number of CPU cores. So 2x stands for 8 core, 4x the 16 core, all the way up to 16x that's 64 core. And uh, never, not to mention they have different prices. And the storage choices are also enormous. So here I have uh, this uh, SSD IO, this IO, is the kind of instance that's uh, I I optimized uh, storage, and also the GP. This is uh, called a general purpose uh, solid state disk storage uh, options. So they are priced differently. Uh, the IOPS one is um, more expensive <coughs> than this uh, general purpose one. But uh, so that's why we want to um, actually choose this uh, optimal or choose the right amount of storage right type of storage to get the most uh, cost efficient solutions. And this is covered by Dopio. Uh, um, this is published in ISPAS last year, and that's uh, one of the four best paper candidate. So in this paper, we proposed an IO well on the link modeling for genome applications, where we quantify this IO impact on this uh, computation. And also uh, in that paper, we propose a systematic way to derive the customized the storage, the size and also the type to achieve the optimal cost. So in this, um, this is also covered in my uh, oral exam. So today I will just use this as a black box and then to get this uh, conclusion from this dopio optimization. 
um, for genome application. You mean for those two SSDs, uh, are there any performance differences? They have performance difference. For IOPS SSD, they have higher IOPS, IO operation specific comparing to generative one. You can think of it as a, a good SSD or a lower SSD. Thank you. Yeah. By how much? Genome applications, particularly uh, size, matters more than this IOPS. So we uh, we we actually takes into consideration all, all those input data we need. That is VCFI, that is the known variants in the genome. FASTQ file is the input data, and uh, <coughs> sorry, that's reference input, input uh, FASTQ data, and the input FASTQ data, and also output FASTQ. So together we have uh, around like 250 gigabytes whole genome. And that's the data uh, storage we need. And we choose this uh, general purpose because size matters more than the IOPS. We don't need that higher performance solid state in this case. So this general purpose is enough. So we choose the second one in our public cloud solutions. And the, the, for the public cloud uh, solution uh, instances, all those different type of uh, instances, they have different runtime for different stage. So here's a table I showed for three different applications with all those uh, 12, of, 12 out of them. So NA stands for not available because for this kind of uh, instance, they are too small or memory is not large enough to run any like uh, aligner on these instances. But for other stages, they can finish successfully. So we, uh, so we actually describe this uh, problem as a uh, mixed integer linear programming problems. Uh, I, would go, I will explain the inputs, the constraint, and also the output optimization goals here. So input is, input includes, first is the uh, runtime for different type of instances for different stage. And uh, the deadline, uh, that's the, uh, you want to finish before this uh, given deadline. And the number of genomes, uh, that's the number of read. And also the task, Itself, that's uh, you need to give uh, the uh, give the task uh, description of this uh, of this uh, given applications. So these are the inputs to this problem, and uh, the objective is to minimize the total cost and the constraints, which I will explain uh, late in the later slides. And the output is the allocation variable indicating that okay, for genome one stage zero, it should be scheduled using this uh, type, for example, M five instances. That's the output. So the scheduling constraints are uh, basically two parts. So the first one is a hardware resource constraint. So if two tasks are scheduled onto the same instances, then they cannot over, uh, they do not overlap. But if they are scheduled onto different instances, they overlap. They can overlap. For example, this one is that uh, the orange one and the yellow one, because they are in, uh, scheduled to different uh, instances, so you can overlap these two tasks uh, in the time frame. But if you are uh, scheduling them onto the same type of uh, instances, then you can only do them sequentially. So this is how well resource constraint. And also the deadline constraints that the final finish time or the maximum of this all the runtime should be less than deadline. So that's the second set of constraints. And also the third set is the task dependency constraints. So you can only uh, start BQSR stage after BW and the HTC after BQSR. That's the task uh, dependency constraint. So we describe this and then I generate a script given me the input, then I can generate the LP formulizations um, uh, automatically, and then put this uh, LP formulas into PSAC, IBM PSAC, and then solve it, so give the optimal solution. So we're, um, when given only one read, we have the optimization or scheduling result shown here. So the x-axis is the deadline constraint you uh, set, and the y-axis is the dollars or the uh, actual cost you have paid. So, so starting from the loose constraint to this uh, tighter constraint, this cost you paid is higher and higher, and then in a like stale uh, kind of way, because you have some, uh, and uh, I want to uh, explain two points uh, specifically. So the first one is the uh, 
most of types of constraints that when given 100, uh, sorry, 198 seconds, that corresponds to five point, uh, five hours. You need seventy dollars just to finish this whole genome. We said this is like a emergency or VIP services for just one whole genome to finish in five hours. But if you have very loose constraints, for example, more than 24 hours, more than a day, you only need $10 to finish that. So that's the uh, trade-off you have for time and also the cost. This is without epigenetics. No epigenetics. Yeah. You are sharp yet. And with epigenetics, it's also clear. If we consider the new instances with this uh, composable computer instances, for example, this one, if uh, we uh, put them together, we actually can achieve a lower cost when we are given a very tight uh, deadline constraint. So now this uh, cost for finishing this one has been uh, reduced from $70 to $56. That comes from the hepatitis college stage. And that's where we can think this optimization helps in this public cloud scheduling. And if you have a batches of reads, for example, at least uh, two or three or four, the cost, the savings, uh, you can also um, uh, have this uh, time and the cost uh, trade-off. Uh, if you set for two genomes, this uh, cost and the um, time trade-off is almost the same as uh, one uh, number of sequences as one, but only difference is in the later part. So when you have a really longer uh, constraint, for example here, deadline more than 8, 700 seconds, you have $10.7. 70 cents, but if you lose it for two sequences, more than four, uh, 139 hundred seconds, it can give you 10 cents benefit. So where does this 10 cents benefit come from? It actually comes from this pipelining when using the same set of uh, instances. For example, here you have three different instances corresponding to this aligner, UQSR, and HTC. This is three instances here. When you launch the first uh, S, Zero, sequence zero BWA, then you can start S1 BWA after you finish S0. And uh, at the same time, the S0 BQSR can start on the sec second instances. And uh, in a pipeline way, it can finish. So the last stage of the S1 accounts for the, uh, I made a mistake, sorry. This should be another zero here. Uh, that accounts for more than uh, some more seconds, 4,000 4, 4, seconds for the last stage. So that's where the benefit uh, comes from. So we consider this uh, for, uh, we extend this from one to two and two to three to two, three to four. You can imagine that uh, this one can also give some benefits. So this benefits, okay, sorry, before we go on, I want to explain this 10 cents benefits. Where does it come from? It actually comes from this uh, reduced overhead in setting up the instances. So whenever you launch an instance, you need some time first to request it and then to install all those tools you want. For example, be the way tool, the GTK tool, you also need the data, the common reference data downloading. So that's the setup time you have. If you do this for one time, for one instance, you pay one time. But if you do this for multiple instances, you actually uh, diminish this part of the overhead so that you can gain some. So that's why when we increase the number of uh, sequences, uh, you have to be, you need to process the minimum cost um, reduces, but this benefit is smaller and smaller. Do you consider the spot instance? For the whole, no. Um, so because that make a huge difference. Yeah, spot instances, mm, it's a, uh, we have, uh, so one prior word consider spot instances has trade off of your bid price and also this uh, failing opportunity. So they have some models to do that. But for now, I don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that will probably be more the real cost probably will be much lower. Uh, it can shrink by half, I guess. Yeah. And then but you need a way to recover from that. Yeah, that's, that's uh, usually uh, need to do re-downloading data and then also re-launch. And then your model will be also more interesting because it will not be deterministic, it will be probabilistic. Yeah, that's true. So, f so if we consider like 1% benefit is uh, good enough, shall we go on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the 1% enough, uh, benefit is enough, we can actually now use this configuration of number of sequences too as a base cases for any given number of sequences. For example, you now are given 10 sequences. 
you just uh, uh, and also you have a new deadline now but you just look this uh, sequence number as two lookup table to get this configurations of the sequence two and then duplicate that by five times so then that's how we can do this uh, uh, scheduling because uh, if you increase the number of sequences the LP constraint and the parameters uh, explodes and then it takes a lot of times to do that And then, last part, we want to... So did you only consider an ILP approach, or did you try other kinds of heuristic? So for this okay. one, the last part is the heuristic, um, considering the number of sequence. We duplicate these basic cases, right? We want to um, get uh, all tumor solutions. But I wonder if a heuristic approach that didn't limit itself to num sequence equals two could actually be better than this one. Or is there some evidence that this would be good enough? So you're right, there are more, many more heuristics that we can try. For now, I don't. Hmm. But is this, uh, are these the number produced by a model, or did you also validate it? I validated it, yeah. So, so those are actual? Actual costs. Like actual costs, yes. okay. And uh, for private cloud, that's uh, an, another problem we have quite different from this public cloud. So for pr a private cloud, we are considering, uh, for example, CDS cluster, we have these servers which has a fixed number of CPU ports and fixed uh, storage uh, SSD or hard disks. And uh, you are given a number of uh, sequences or reads. And uh, the target is that you want to get the minimum runtime or the maximum throughput. So that's another story. So for this uh, uh, private cloud, we want to minimize the runtime. And uh, um, before we go on, I want to emphasize the runtime uh, uh, modeling first. So here we are considering a runtime which has a sequence part and also a parallel part. So for example, if an application hypertech caller is scheduled onto uh, multiple CPU cores, the runtime can be described as a sequential part C0 or C constant part plus a parallelizable part divided by the number of uh, parallels that you have. So this is a runtime model we have. And uh, uh, as you can see here, that if we uh, launch just one, for example, P equals to one, this uh, CPU core, uh, CPU time can take really, really long, but it only takes one time overhead for C0. If you like uh, increase the parallelism, for example, 10, then every partition, you actually have to pay this uh, sequential part overhead. So that's something we want to keep in mind is that we want to um, we want to actually use the least number of CPU cores for each genomes to reduce the overall CPU runtime, right? But that's not gonna happen because if you launch fifty six genomes together in just one server, that will explode your storage. You only have two terabytes uh, storage, and uh, each genome you need at least two hundred fifty gigabytes. That only allows you around eight genomes running in parallel. So these eight genomes each with, for example, seven cores. And uh, we also consider this as an ILP problem and uh, takes input of this uh, uh, hardware constraint and also the input of the genome and also the task graph description. Want to do minimize runtime and the constraint is that also the hardware resources, but now the hardware resource has two folds, the CPU and also the storage. And uh, also we need to consider the dependency constraint we feed it into the CPLEX, and now it gives me the result. It uh, actually stops really quickly for one to two to two, three to four, but then it stops. So it's uh, stuck there for many, many days and cannot give me uh, uh, um, um, feasible solutions. Uh, so how are we gonna approach that? Uh, first, I actually observe the optimal results from this uh, solver want to see what's the patterns for get these uh, optimal solutions. So one obvious uh, uh, phenomenon is that uh, all of them, uh, for each genome, the uh, number of uh, cores scheduled to them are evenly distributed. For example, for two, each of them get 28 cores. For four, each of them get 14 cores. For three, they actually get a kind of weird uh, uh, allocation, but in total, 56 and as even as possible. So I'll explain this uh, detail later. And uh, I want to, uh, 
because this problem is uh, like takes many hours to finish we put forward uh, three heuristics and then check their error rates against three different problem sizes so and uh, we want to pick the best heuristic so that we can get uh, or obtain a good runtime so for other genome standards uh, I manually construct two problem sizes and that is the only partial uh, part of this uh, full full uh, four cases. So four cases like a six, 56 core with eight, uh, eight genomes in parallel, but manually construct our 14 cores with two storage and 28 cores with four, because that gives me more opportunities to compare with, against the, with the golden solutions. So the first heuristic is, uh, uh, is quite uh, simple and intuitive, is that uh, whatever the number of genomes you have, I just uh, consider uh, one genome or two genomes, and then I sequentially run them, like a genome of two or two or two or two or one. And then I can construct uh, any given number of genomes. For example, five is two plus plus two plus one. And I compare this against uh, this uh, golden result for different three different cases. So for this smallest cases, so let's just focus on the last uh, um, uh, column, that's the error rate. So error rate looks good, right? It's less than 1%. But if we increase this uh, problem sizes, this error rate quickly uh, goes up to like 5% or 6%. And if for the full cases, it goes up to 14%, which is not as good as we, uh, it's not tolerable. So we propose the second heuristic that we want to distribute cores among genomes as even as possible. When I mean as even as possible, that's, uh, uh, I give one example here is that when there are only three genomes, for 56 cores, you want to distribute them to as 19 and 19 and 18 for both stages. So they didn't change the core number during the execution number for different stages. And this actually gives a better result. So let's just look at this middle arrow uh, column and the last column for the arrow for both uh, heuristics. So comparing to heuristic one, heuristic two gives much better results for all the three different cases. So let's just look at this red uh, block and uh, red uh, text. So this comparing the heuristic two is much better than heuristic one in both three cases. And also I val validate this uh, in our CDSA cluster and get less than 4.2 percentage error rate uh, for this uh, NA8 A7H governed genome. Sorry, can you go to the slide you have heuristic two? There's a diagram. This one? Yeah. Does it make sense that uh, you give more cores to that uh, genome three? I would say. Yeah, because otherwise it's uh, kind of a, that one got short change. Yeah, so you are right. Uh -huh. We actually look into details of the heuristic two uh, and the optimal solution because yeah. there are difference. We want to see how does the difference come from, and actually that comes from exactly what we're talking about. So for this one, for the stage zero, if it has a smaller number of cores. How about we uh, compensate them back by using more cores in the later stage? To catch up. To catch up, yeah. Oh. So that's why it gets catch up um, by this uh, spelled one course from each other, you know, and then actually it shows better run time. That's where this 1%, one, one percentage comes from. We look into this uh, heuristic, oh, we look into other cases as well. So, and this apply to other number of uh, sequences. For example, for five. So for five is like, even distributed as uh, four of them 11, but another one of them is 12. So this one, because you are slower, so you want to get compensated back, so every one of them gets one back. But that's a lot, that's four cores, like greatly hurts the first uh, genome. So that one actually gives a longer long time for this, comparing to the heuristic two. So this does not always work, but it can work for some cases. I call it balance of well heuristic two as a third heuristic. Sorry, I think this is going to be a little bit of a diversion, but yeah. is there a reason why you have to have such coarse grain tasks? Because it seems like the reason why you're having this imbalance is that you have um, tasks that have to be so long running that one could might be taking a lot longer than the other ones and you didn't know it. Does you have to consider the task to be a uh, you know one genome, or could you break it down into smaller pieces? Oh yeah, so this one, each of them is a genome which partitioned to eleven genome pieces. Maybe you should explain why it's a genome. 
Juno with many leaves. Oh, yeah. Juno with many leaves. How many leaves? One billion leaves. Okay, so let's say that you had, uh, so what would stop you from, let's say you got to the point where you only had one genome left, right, at one. the top, at the top, at the top right there. Oh, yeah. So couldn't you redistribute the work somehow among all of the cores that you had remaining? Or is that too hard? For uh, you're right, because, for example, when it's done, you can now launch the data. That's what we call, uh, uh, that's the scheduling different from here, if you have to change the partition during the runtime, which we don't have here. So the problem is the partitioning of the data. But that's a good point, you could do work freely. Right? Then that probably introduces code modification. I think her scenario is to use the current code and decide the best scaling policy for the current code. That's true. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to. OK. Well, you can still use the current code. And uh, we actually examined these all cases from one to eight, and then uh, we found uh, actually another improvement here that they actually help for further improvement comparing to this heuristic too. So this balance of well heuristic two, or I call star heuristic two, is better than this um, heuristic one and two. And for more, uh, for when there are more genomes than this eight, like the maximum parallelism genome you have. We also can propose, uh, so now it's all, um, we can use other, uh, another, layer of <coughs> another layer of optimization, that is that we consider all those base cases. So we treat, or we, we propose two methods to compose this uh, runtime scheduling. Um, for, first one is that uh, for each eight genomes as a batch, I launch them. And then for the last batch, the rest of the genome, I pick up the optimal one from these eight base cases. That's the first one. The second method is that I can compose um, many uh, different uh, number of genomes together. I can compose, for example, seven plus seven versus uh, eight plus six. So I, I actually, uh, this method two is another layer of IOP, which is really fast to solve. And uh, it gives uh, this optimization result. Here, so this dog, they are almost overlap with each other for all the cases, except some of the points which is not zero. So these points are the cases where this method one, we call the batch method, is slower than the method two, which I call smart. Well, what are the axes in this graph? You mean this one? Yeah. This is the number of genomes. Number of genomes. Yeah, this is the long time. Oh. Yeah. And uh, so these three cases here is that, for example, this one is that when you are given 11 genomes, this batch one, oh sorry, method one is like first batch is eight plus three, and second one is seven plus four. So it's actually much, it's better, a little bit better than this one. And this for 14, so eight plus six is longer than seven plus seven. So there are some like uh, uh, cases like this, which allows you to do further optimization when using method two. And uh, uh, I want to conclude this. Uh, um, but wait a minute, you have to use three methods, right? That the one is the only method to use. This is method three? No, this is method one and two. Only, only two methods. So the three methods, heuristics, are for the base case discussion. Uh -huh, uh -huh. But this one is like another layer. Like when there are many, many more genomes, for example, 100 genomes. Okay. Yeah. Because you cannot even launch more than eight, um, eight, more than eight genomes in parallel, right? So we just treat those eight as a uh, eight genomes and and most as a uh, base cases. You're right. So your variables. What what's your variables in this case? Oh, you mean that's the two variables? Yeah. The variables are the number of uh, base cases you have. For example, for base case one, you have a variable. For case two, you have a variable. For case three, you have variables. And uh, and uh, you want to compose them together. Up to eight. Up to eight. Yeah. For example, this one it gives the result as okay. The optimization allocation is that I have 
three batches of seven genomes running. So one seven and one seven and one seven. So that's the fifth variable at seven base pages at three. Uh -huh. That's the scheduling result. Okay. Well, and then how do you get method one? Method one? That's one is like you just cut them by eight. Divided well, by you eight. always go with eight. Yes, always go with eight. That's greedy, that's what I understand. Uh, yeah, greedy. And then you show method two is better than. It's better than method one in but these cases. By how much? By like two hundred and uh, two thousand seconds. Okay. Oh, only those discrete points. The only discrete points. Yes, all are zero actually. No difference, except right. some of the cases. Okay. Okay. That's uh, basically overlap. And uh, I want to conclude uh, this part is that with this node level cost optimization and performance uh, analytic modeling, we now have this uh, computation or composable instances which can further optimize the cost comparing to prior work. Because prior work doesn't consider this uh, a new type of instances. We can actually compose whatever we want. And for the private cloud, this one is that the heuristic is more like customized to this problem only because. Uh, the genome data is uh, kind of regular, and if you are given, uh, for example, 40x or 30x coverage genome data, the run times are almost the same, so then, so that you can evenly distrib or split this cores. So this heuristic is quite customized to this problem itself. Yeah, so lastly, I want to give uh, this um, a reference of my work to, to this dissertation and also thank collaborator and also the landmates uh, in uh, all those projects. So before thesis proposal, I have published in SSM 16 and also in class 18. And after thesis proposal, uh, one paper in SSM 18, that's last day. And also I'm trying to make permission for the MOCA. And uh, uh, I really want to thank uh, whoever helped me in this energy pipeline project, Tokyo project, Lake and MOCA project. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Do you have a cluster? Each one has a hundred terabytes. No, no, we just so I mean, there's like a what's called frame mapping people who do, who put a bit of cluster. Yeah. So we bought cluster to it there, and mm -hmm. we bought hundred terabytes to it there. So I don't know how much total space they have, yes. but we bought hundred terabytes to it there. A shared amount for the server. Yeah, yeah. How many servers are you using? Oh, you mean the, in terms of CPU? CPU cores? Yeah. CPU. I think they have about 700 cores, 800 cores. Uh -huh. Yeah. And then those are, each server is like a 40, 50 cores. So yeah, 30, 50, 30, 50, 40, 40, 40, 40. About the same as our configuration, yeah. it's like a giant yeah. server. Yeah, but it's shared with our Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And for them, it's more like a, a storage node, so it's kind of yeah. something like a remote. Shared yeah. storage node. And uh, your local also have some disk space. Yes, yes. So you mean not shared with other yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, we have like they are storage server. This is not like you cannot run in job because yeah. it's just the data storage. But that hundred terabyte is for storage. No, it is for the compute too. Also for compute yeah, yeah. to really yeah. interact with yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. 
they just run through a 2,000 whole genome. Yeah. And you could use that as a study for four months. So if you can speed up to two months, and uh, that's a, so it's a real workflow. But it will be, do you have anything else in the pipeline? Uh, not, not in a moment, yeah. 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 Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I mean, there is like a whole bunch of like pipelines coming out these days, so you might want to like compare to the other. Because I know that this like one pipeline that actually optimized for the, not, not optimized, but they just did a pipeline for AWS, and then they have some core cool analysis there. So Which pipeline? It is called this one, like, I don't know, the CPA pipeline. Um, okay. You might want to take a look Maybe at it. Maybe you can email us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. In the supplementary, they have the how much money spent for each of these EWA, all that stuff. But they are not trying to optimize. They are, they are not like computer scientists. They are more like a Users, yeah. users, yeah. Uh -huh. But they developed this pipeline so that other people can use it. Sure. So yeah. they, they did, I don't think they did, they did any optimization. They just implemented it. Yeah. That's a good point. You, you somehow have to show this methodology can be generalized on other pipelines. It's not so specific. I can ask the generic question, which is, uh, now that you're all done with everything, would you, and looking back on your experience, would you have done anything differently? For now, it only applies to one, one like uh, framework, but actually it's applicable to other private clouds and also other cluster setting as well. Yeah. So that I can have more results. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>